on to the computational materials and data analytics specialization presentation. Uh, myself, I'm Irenius. Oh, I'm Irenius Swang, and I uh, I was really interested in this uh, first off when I was in first year. I actually really enjoyed the content in Materials 1 MO3, which is originally the materials course, but I also had a little bit of hand in kind of just basic programming. But then I got a lot of exposure and experience during my first year talking to the professors, including Dr. Greenwood, as well as the chair. And then I kind of got involved in this. And a little bit about myself, I am a huge volleyball fan. So if you have, <laughs> if you want to talk about anything volleyball related, I also play some games as well. Feel free to uh, message me later. And joined with me, Dr. Michael Greenwood. Hello, everybody. I'm an uh, adjunct professor at McMaster University. I am also a research scientist with Natural Resources Can Canada. Uh, and we're just down the road in the CAMAT Materials Laboratory in the McMaster Innovation Park. My specialty is in computational materials and data analytics. Um, my first co-op work term was actually to do programming for lithium-ion battery research. Uh, we were developing uh, charging systems for actually re discharging and recharging batteries to test how well they perform in that. All right. Thank you, Mike. Oh, sorry, Mike. Um, can you mute your mic while I'm talking so it doesn't echo? I think that's the feedback oh, I'm getting. Yeah. Already <laughs> doing it. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, just mute your mic when I'm talking, or, or I guess when you're not talking kind of thing. All right. Uh, so going into the computational materials, we've kind of divided it into three main sections, as you see here. And uh, first off is like the automation and data processing, which is really all encompassing because it's directly related, as you can see in a triangle, and it's directly connected to the other aspects of it. And so we're going to start explaining it through there. And so for the automation and data processing, the first bit is kind of about the manipulation of the experimental data that material scientists can get. And I'll be explaining it uh, through the co-op experience for myself for Fibix Incorporated, which is a company that I worked on after my first year of engineering. And they specialize on these dual and developing software as well as hardware for these dual beam systems uh, where you can see in the schematic here, there's a electron beam at the top, which provides some imaging. And then there's a ion beam, typically gallium, uh, there's an ion beam that provides another source of energy, which actually can, if you see on this right schematic, it can actually mill off surfaces of your uh, sample. So using these two beams are really cool together because you can do uh, subsequent imaging and then milling of a surface. So then theoretically, you can get kind of a 3D representation throughout this uh, iterative process. And so basically what I was doing there is uh, one of the, the coolest things that I was working on was basically working on like a stack alignment application where I was using something called point, point tracking, where you can see where this coffee cup, it's swirling around and I've programmed it so that the points will go through frame by frame and look for where it was in the previous frame. And in doing so, I can create a kind of vector field, which tells me uh, information about how the coffee uh, droplets are evolving throughout the data set. And then here in this example, on the very left, left, this is a data set of muscle tissue that uh, is extremely misaligned and is very hard to interpret, but then kind of back calculating the flow of the image using this technique of point tracking, I can make it quite smooth. And it looks pretty cool. It's kind of like a neat party trick. Uh, but then what's really more interesting is if you kind of zoomed in on where this muscle tissue is, you'll be able to see a lot more detail like this. And then in doing so, you can see the advantages of aligning it where uh, the muscle tissue evolution through it is much easier to perceive, and we can make more uh, conclusions based on that as a material scientist, or in this case, a biologist. But this code is uh, regardless already implemented in their systems, and so it can be used for just that. All right, and I'm going to pass over to Mike to talk to you a little bit more about this automation applications. Yeah, so over at uh, CAMET Materials, what we really do is we're mandated to do materials research, but in the area of um, energy efficiency and for clean energy technology. Um, so what happened a couple years ago, probably about four years ago, there was an, a large international effort which was called Mission Innovation. And through this, uh, they did a number of challenges. And these challenges were the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the challenges was really around developing AI technology and automation to develop materials to get the materials that we need to market to reach our GHG targets that 
internationally we're trying to achieve. So what we're doing over at CanMap Materials in partnership with both McMaster, University of Toronto, and the National Research Council of Canada is to develop what we're calling is a materials acceleration platform. And so this is a multidisciplinary research topic, which is going to require skill sets and many hands to actually develop this. And it involves using robotics to actually perform the experiments. We're going to have to then have material scientists who are deciding what type of experiments need to be done. And then we're going to be linking all of this data that's being collected by the robots into a database, which is then fed into an artificial intelligence system, which will then decide autonomously what experiment is going to be done next. And then this creates a closed loop system where in a very short amount of time, about 10 to 20 minutes is the target for a complete loop of an experiment. And so then you can do thousands of experiments over the course of a year, but in an intelligent way that is driven by the artificial intelligence. So we're building one at CAMAT Materials right now is to generate thermoelectric devices, which will recapture waste heat from industrial processes and automobiles to reconvert that into electricity. We're also partnering with NRC, which is opening a new lab in Mississauga, and they're going to be doing research on battery technology, and they'll be developing a map around that. In fact, we're actually in the process of hiring a co-op student uh, for next term, and we'll possibly be hiring co-op students going forward in the future. So Arrhenius, if you want to throw it off to the next slide. Uh, another big area that we're getting into is around the concept called uh, Industry 4.0. And this is linking artificial intelligence into industrial processes. Uh, about three years ago, the federal government threw uh, a large amount of money into what they call these superclusters. And one of these was around the advanced manufacturing supercluster. And so what this cluster was uh, almost, I think, half a billion dollars to develop research to interface with sensors to create live data and to use artificial intelligence to modernize and make decisions on the fly at the product floor in how to actually produce the materials in a more intelligent way and to increase the overall efficiency. So one of these uh, projects we're kind of doing along around the Industry 4.0 theme is with Hydro-Quebec, where we're actually developing models for each part in the repair process and and in the life of a turbine runner, which over the life of its 50 years can undergo a lot of fatigue stresses. And so being able to predict when these turbines are going to repair and how to optimally select the repair schedule and the repair process, you could save a lot of downtime in terms of that. And the big motivating factor for this is the emergence of what is called smart grid. And smart grid starts throttling the various electrical grid networks at peak times and low times, and it'll choose different uh, turbines to shut down at different given times. But this creates a lot of additional stress on the turbine runners, which is why we need to do the, uh, to create what we call this digital twin. So somebody who's coming in as a co-op student might do work uh, either running simulations, you might do data management. We have a lot of work that we need to do in even running and validating the simulations. We'll have programming needs for both fitting models, interacting with software, and most of this will always be done under, under supervision. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. And going forward with kind of the industry 4.0 narrative is uh, some experience. Right now, I'm actually on my co-op term at Hatch LTD. And I'm actually working on a really cool sustainable electric steel making project where uh, we're kind of involving the industry 4.0 uh, kind of sense of modeling it in real time and then taking the real time data and then processing that and kind of getting an optimal solution to um, basically make the client quite happy. So first off is uh, electric arc furnace. This is a technique in steel making where the input, instead of using uh, typical like coke or coal in the blast furnace, we're actually just using electricity as well as we're actually recycling the, the scrap steels that, uh, that are being input as well as something called direct reduced iron, which is a type of processed iron ore. And then in doing so, all we have to do is apply some electrical current and then we can actually tap out the desired steel. And my, my kind of role in it is kind of on the uh, modeling standpoint, where uh, right now it's like we have the 
or the goal in the in the end is to have the client uh, give us real time data, and then it'll pass it through the process model, which will also perform some sort of optimization. And then then they can, for example, optimize to reduce electricity consumption. And my role in that specifically is kind of in this interface model where I'm working on the Python end, uh, which is kind of the same Python that really you learn in first year add a couple of libraries. And that's more or less what I do. And even though just using some simple Python, we can really uh, save clients like this a lot of money. And in doing so, it'll make the process more viable. And more or less, it'll decrease the total emissions of um, steel making in the world, which is pretty cool. And another thing that's really cool about the computational materials at McMaster is that we have some undergraduate experiences in terms of research. And this is a project that I myself, as well as my colleague, Jeremy Wilson, have been working with Dr. Uh, Greenwood, as well as the chair, Dr. Zarab, as well as even Dr. Yu. Uh, and basically what we're doing here is that we're using this open source code called Anastruct um, to construct these lattice representations. We're going to perform some optimization uh, to optimize for a specific parameter, which is why it's property selective. And in this case, we're actually optimizing for uh, stiffness. So we want the stiffest material, which also means the lowest displacement values. And in doing so, you can kind of see here that uh, we were able to do some simulation using this and then we also wanted to apply some optimization. So, so far we've been able to optimize using some genetic algorithms shown in this little diagram here. And it's very simple. It's very easy to implement, uh, very approachable for someone who finishes, for example, first year engineering and they have some basic Python knowledge, it's very approachable for them to do that themselves. And then in this case, this is actually really interesting. In this five by five preliminary case, we are able to optimize for a stiffest solution, which kind of shows this kind of protrusions here. And this is not really what we were expecting, so this is kind of interesting for that. And another research project that was really interesting and related to this project is one that was actually done and started by Dr. Yu, uh, as well as he has an undergraduate thesis student now, Adam Tybmer, as well as uh, Sarah Gonder, who is actually the research uh, assistant who started this project uh, this past summer in 2020. And she's also currently working on it as well, and I'll be more or less talking about her work and contributions so far on the computational end. And the motivation for this project is seen here. So in layman's terms, uh, this is to be applied to something like a helmet. And for example, in a bicycle helmet, typically when they're designed, they're really kind of designed to take high impacts, uh, high linear impacts with really high g-forces. But then this really kind of, um, this is not the total case, as in some cases you'll have low g-forces as well as rotational impacts. And this is really important to consider because those are actually really huge causes for concussions. And basically, they're trying to fix this problem. And you can see here a big motivation of this, or I guess inspiration of this project, is this Hexar helmet, which is a commercially, I guess, available uh, 3D printing, 3D printed uh, helmet liner here using hexagonal lattices. And the reason why this is good is because hexagons are an exceptional cellular and repeatable material for this kind of compression and uh, energy absorption application. And why this work was motivated, especially if you can see in this image that zoomed in here for the Hexar helmet, you can see that there are two different planes of hexagons where on the top plane, you have a kind of smaller lattice. On the bottom plane, it's a little bit bigger. But then the thing that's really concerning is how they interface the two with this kind of jagged hexagonal uh, structure here. And this kind of mismatching of hexagons can potentially lead to catastrophic catastrophic failure of the helmet given the right circumstances of impact. And that's kind of the motivation of uh, Sarah's work. So I, and I'll say motivation a lot, but this is kind of an inspiration as well, where they have the two different planes of hexagons in the Hexar helmet. So the question is, how do we tile this so it's efficient and is able to deform properly when in an impact? And here you can see this is uh, a TEM uh, transmission electron microscope, as well as a numerical representation of graphene in 2D. And you can see that although there are two kind of intersecting planes of hexagons, uh, they're actually well accommodated together using these blue and red demonstrated defects in 2D. And this principle of applying defects to uh, you know, mesh different planes together is also applicable in 3D as shown by this curved graphene structure here. And Sarah's role is so far has been applying the computational means using Python. And Python is a really great language and you can do a lot of rapid prototyping like that. And what she's doing is kind of simulating this sort of grain formation in nature by having the two different planes of hexagons, as well as the line in the middle representing the boundary that will kind of mesh the two different planes of hexagons so that this can be easily tiled in 2D. And then work is being done by Adam Tybmer, who is the thesis student to 
kind of project this into the 3D and make this possible so that uh, right now they've actually bought 3D printers and they're going to be uh, rapid prototyping in 3D as well very soon. So it's really exciting work that can potentially influence something as huge as all of the helmet industry in the world. So it's some really cool stuff. Um, okay, and next I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Greenwood again help me talk about some courses as the computational material stream is emerging right now and it's it has a lot of potential and Dr. Greenwood is actually working directly on developing one of the courses for it. So take it away. Yeah, so presently the materials department at McMaster has two courses in computational modeling. Uh, often. Uh, every other year, I think, at one this works at the nanoscale is basically doing simulations of atomistic interactions and, and DFT type simulations. The other one is in more in process scale modeling. Both of these courses will give, give you experience in using uh, software and how to actually make um, assumptions based off of these and how to feed information upwards into your physical systems where you're doing the experiments. Um, but a big emerging area that's happening now in as a hot topic is this area of machine learning. As I mentioned in both the maps and in the other project, we're actually applying machine learning technology in developing these digital twins and these autonomous development platforms. Uh, but what there is for in businesses right now is a hunger out there for really learning how to incorporate machine learning into their business model. And often there's not really a good feel for a cross-disciplinary uh, expert who has both their foot on the ground in terms of knowing the subject matter and having that experience of knowing the machine learning. You either get one or the other. And so making that connection is very difficult. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to design this course, which will kind of create that bridge for a subset of people who are interested in taking the course, where it'll give you uh, some hands-on experience in running some of the machine learning models and kind of understanding the basic theory of where they're coming from and understanding what they're good for and what they're not good for. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. And this is actually a really good point to kind of move on on some more student experiences where, for example, uh, McMaster's uh, computational stream has also been involved in the kind of other aspects, not only just materials. For example, this is the uh, Delta Hacks Materials Challenge, which we had for the past year, if you're not familiar uh, with Delta Hacks. It's a hackathon where basically for 24 hours, you are in a team of four, and you're trying to solve one problem using, I guess, your computer and coding. And in this case, uh, my team competed last year in the Delta Hacks Materials Challenge, where they gave us kind of these this one image of a steel uh, simulated steel structure and they said good luck with it tell us as much as you can about this and the base long story short we were able to uh because I, I had some previous experience at fibix doing some image processing i showed earlier with the kind of stack alignment and using kind of the same principles uh not with the stack alignment but with some basic image processing i was able to come up with some uh, seg uh some <clears throat> segmentations of the different types of grain so you can see there's a white a dark as well as these kind of perlites and the reason why we did really well wasn't because I was really good at programming and image processing, but it was more that we knew as material science or material science students, we knew what's important. We know from this image directly, I can tell you, like, for example, in first year, you learn something called the Hall-Petch equation, which will relate to the yield strength of a material, which is quite important in mechanical sense, uh, the yield strength to its grain sizes. And so since I know that, I want to take care, I want to take note of the grain diameters for the different phases, as well as even the orientations of these kind of uh, lamellar looking structures. And in doing so, this can tell a material scientist a lot more than simply just saying, this is white, this is black, this is a different phase. And that's kind of going into a little bit about what Mike was talking about, where in many cases, you can only have one, one, one or the other materials knowledge or computational machine learning knowledge. And this is kind of the point of that we're trying to make with computational materials is that when you have both, you can do some really powerful and really cool things. So that's the Delta Hex. And then as well, other uh, activities at the school with regards to computational materials. We recently started, my colleague and I, Jeremy Wilson, started the Computational Materials Society. And one huge portion of it is actually we're doing tutorials and workshops. And you can see here Python, which is our favorite language, as well as some libraries doing some Im image processing with OpenCV or TensorFlow, which is some basic machine learning. It's very powerful, but also very easy to use. And we're basically trying to not only share the knowledge that we have, but also take this as an opportunity to expand our knowledge and in, in the computational sense, as well as apply in real life applications for material science problems. And in doing so, for example, 
Uh, last year, and we're still working on it now, my colleague and I, Kevin Mensa, we're working on a industry collaboration with a company called Steel Image. And they are act this is actually a company founded by a McMaster Materials grad, and they do failure analysis for various steel and other metallurgical applications. So they gave us a problem where, very similar to the Delta Hacks problem, where there's a real life steel grain image. And since it's real life, there's a lot more things to consider. And Kevin Mensa helped develop a neural, uh, a neural network to basically clean it up and give me something that I can work with to post-process. And in doing so, uh, since we're <laughs> material science students, we know what's important. And uh, the, even the, our, our contact Shane from Steel Image mentioned too, he wants to know the fraction of dark to light phases. And that's what we've been able to accomplish. And we're still working with them and corresponding on different things as well. So that's another aspect of that. And yeah. I think that more or less covers the, I, I guess, my experience as well as uh, very preliminary uh, Mike's experience as well in the department and more or less the kind of things you can expect if you are planning to or in second year kind of choosing a uh, stream in materials engineering. So that'll be that for our presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll be in the session section.